on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Welcome to Corner of the Galaxy, the show that talks 100% LA Galaxy soccer. We're glad you could join us. Now it's time to sit back and relax as your hosts navigate through the twisting, turning, but never boring world of the five-time MLS Cup champion, LA Galaxy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corner of the Galaxy on cornerofthegalaxy.com. I'm your host, Josh Gessman, coming to you on this wonderful Thursday, September 22nd. LA Galaxy getting ready to play one of the most significant games of the season. I'm not saying it's the most important. I don't think we're there yet. But this is the most significant game the LA Galaxy can play. This is the mythical. The ever talked about now for months and months. The game in hand the Galaxy have against every single other team except for the San Jose Earthquakes and really Seattle Sounders who play on Tuesday. Uh, this is the chance for the Galaxy to jump up. We're going to talk about the game. The Cali Classico at Stanford Stadium. Some of the history of games played at Stanford Stadium. We're going to get you through a little bit of the 22 under 22. Not that people really pay that much attention to it, but wanted to get you covered in that. Some of the internationals are missing, and of course, a lot of other LA Galaxy talk. Uh, in order to help me do all that, she's back, and we're glad to have her. She was over, over across the pond for a little bit. She was under the weather for a little bit. Now she is back with us. It's Sophie DeCan and Nicolau. So how's it going? I'm very well, Josh. How are you doing this fine evening? Cracking me up in the green room before the show today. Um, <laughs> I don't. I, I, I would tell that joke. It's just not as funny. Like it, nobody, it wouldn't be as funny no. to the rest of the people if if they heard it. It's not like one of those things where I'm like, oh, I'm not going to tell the joke type thing. It is absolutely 100 percent one of those. If I told it to you, you wouldn't laugh as much. So yeah, no, um, exactly. How are you doing? How you doing? Um, yeah, I'm. I'm doing. I'm doing pretty well. Thanks uh, for asking, and good to be back with you. Yeah, I don't uh, think it's muggy this evening. A little <laughs> bit Southern California muggy. Maybe it's the age. I don't know. You know, it's just a bit muggy this evening. I would. I. I, I kind of agree. The the weather is is a little. It's almost British um, when you think about it. There's some like there's heavy air in there. Um, but you were on. Like sport, what was it? You you were doing transfer talk across the pond, and you got to watch your Arsenal play. I, I imagine in person. Um, so how was how was that trip? It was an incredible trip. Uh, I got to be part of the Sky Sports News transfer deadline day team, which, especially growing up in England, it's kind of like a professional bucket list moment to have that. That was superb. Uh, I was uh, going up against other kind of YouTube channels, Manchester United, Tottenham, had to drill the Tottenham guy, of course, just a little bit, <laughs> even though he's a sweetheart, really. Newcastle, Chelsea, City, Liverpool. It was fun. It was really cool. Got to see Arsenal um, beat Fulham and beat Aston Villa. Mm -hmm. But I made the long trip to Manchester up the motorway uh, for the game at Old Trafford, which started off brilliantly. Right. And one of the best celebrations ever, which VAR took away from us Arsenal fans, and it's a good job. This is a family-driven show. I'll keep yes. it clean. Yes. But um, we ended up not winning that game, and it was pretty brutal. The drive back was only helped by having Marks and Spencer sandwiches. Now, <laughs> oh, I don't know what sandwich you would compare that to. I was going to say. But it's like going home with chicken. You know, like when you want your chicken fingers? Right, like right. When you're on your way home? Right. Marks it's and Spencer's sandwich. It, it's sort of it's sort of that that like comfy delicious thing that yes. you have and that brings you comfort no matter when you eat it right it is yes. it is it is a significant sign of where you are from that food and it makes you feel amazing yes. and it tastes great we'd already had the curry chips and the dirty burger okay um what, you know, what's a dirty so burger what's a, what's a dirty when you buy it off the stand 
oh, you know, okay. I mean, kind of like back in the day, it was food trucks, but really they just have these burger stands and it's just the smell. They smell different. Mm. I don't know if it's the onions and the grilled onions. You know, like when you walk out of the stadium and the you got the hot dog vendors. The bacon, the bacon wrapped hot dogs. I was going to say, is is that similar? Should you eat it? Probably not. But does it smell absolutely, incredibly, intoxicatingly amazing? A hundred percent. I under, I, I get it. I, I get what you're saying. So, uh, the, yeah. Okay. Makes some sense. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad you had a good trip and, and yeah, you made it trip. back and you made it back safely, which is always, uh, always good too. Mike Gray in the chat room says, uh, I'm hungry dudes. Please stop. Um, which I would, I, I, I'm kind of hungry too. Usually too. on show nights, show nights, I don't get a full dinner. Like I usually, I, I made hot dogs on the grill real quick tonight, uh, because that was the fastest thing for me to eat and then get up and, and get, get set. So no, I not bacon. A bowl of, I had a bowl of rice krispies is oh, what I had. I love rice krispies. I did too, to be honest with you. Call. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not upset about it to be yeah, honest. That's, yeah. It's, it's a it good call. Good. Absolutely. Well, speaking yeah. of Mike Gray, I don't know if I showed this picture or not last week. Somebody would have to correct me, but um, at the game on Saturday night, Galaxy History, um, all the way over from uh, the other side of the pond, uh, near near uh, near Sophie, or at least closer than than where uh, we are from here. Uh, the fourth time Galaxy History had attempted to get across the pond and watch a game, <laughs> uh, it was finally the fourth time was the charm apparently and, and successful. So we hope he had a he we somebody said at halftime that he's not allowed to go home. Um, it was the same thing we did with Victor Vasquez's son uh, Leo whenever he was uh, he was here and Victor kept scoring goals. Uh, so Galaxy history wasn't allowed. I'm, I imagine somebody locked him up in their in their trunk and, and said, <laughs> you're not allowed to go because the Galaxy played well while you were here. So um, you introduced him to me. Not lovely chap. Yeah. He, he I mean, he does so much and it's at Galaxy history on Twitter. If people don't know um, or and I think even on Instagram, it's at Galaxy history. He's in our discord as well. Sometimes just like there's just so much that he does that that really it gets rewarded and there's ways that he gets rewarded but it's never it's never going to be enough it's never going to be like you can never mm -hmm. account for all the hours that you put into it and get paid for that and if you did the dude would make like 80 or 90 thousand dollars a year right because right. just the massive amount of time that he puts into all his stuff and researching stuff and and doing that so uh, it was great to see him and the galaxy won so i i think to me that that's like the perfect sort of ending for all of him coming over and and doing all that it was like all right good oh, you no. gotta win when with this team sophie you never know if they're going to win. In fact, you have no idea what this team is going to do. What did you think of the LA Galaxy's 4-1 win over the Colorado Rapids last weekend? Well, one thing I also just realized, by the way, very quick on the broadcast, is that you seem suntanned much more than I now, and we're going to have to rectify that for the next show, uh, looking very, uh, you know, golden. lightly. But yeah, I, very. One, one it's my say light. lightly golden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like French fries, slightly golden. That's how you want them, a little crispy <laughs> on the outside. Um, and still soft on the inside. Uh, I, I would say some of that is lighting because I do have a warm light that is on me. You but do. also I have been spending a tremendous amount of time out in the sun and I am taking stock of all of my suntan lotion and, and doing all that. Very so, good, lad. Yes. Always take care of the skin. That's Listen, right. I, I love that match. It was so much fun. I can't remember the last time I went to an LA Galaxy match and had and enjoyed watching it what about the goals? One banger after another. It was free-flowing, fluid, fearless. It was interesting to me also where Greg said in the presser afterwards, I'm sure you'll get to that, but how he wanted and told Julian to play with freedom. And my goodness, what a Julian we saw in that match. That that Great. was the Julian, right? That was the That's Julian. That's the guy that we've fallen in love with right. and absolutely think that one day he'll go to a European club or climb the ladder and do bigger, greater things. Right. He was absolutely spot on. Brilliant. Uh, the the play in midfield, I just thought, by the way, don't you think shape-wise, mold-wise, um, archetype-wise, uh, Gaston and Delgado, if you were looking at them from the back without their shirt numbers, I, 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 I'd I struggle to figure out who was who. Oh, oh, they they look they look very yeah. I do to get me. yeah. I, I will say even whenever they play out there, that sometimes I'm like, wait, who took that shot from yes. right outside? And and lately it's been Brugman who's been taking the shot, but Delgado had a stinger of a shot early in that game as well. This is yes. I, I think the season high for the Galaxy: twelve shots on goal, uh, twenty shots total, and I think we went over this last time. That's six shots that basically didn't make it. Three of those were blocked, so only three off target the entire night. That's not I mean, the that's not the LA Galaxy we've sort of known. No. Usually they're launching them into row Z. You know what it felt like to me? They came into this game playing 
fearless without anything to lose but lose itself. And that is the difference between pressure situations and feeling the pressure through stress and versus going out there and just playing football. Right. And I don't think the Galaxy have been able to go out there and just play football this season. I can't put my finger on why, because they've played games where they should absolutely annihilate teams and win. Right. They've lost games that they absolutely shouldn't, right? Right. So I can't put my finger on why when I was watching them on Saturday, Sunday. Was it Saturday or Saturday, Sunday? Saturday night. Saturday. Um, that it something came together in a way that players who hadn't played well, like Diego Costa. D- right? Douglas Costa. Douglas, Douglas Costa, the Costa, other one. I always do that. I was talking about Diego Costa on an Arsenal show today about <laughs> what a great m- master he was at Dark Hearts. Yes. Uh, Douglas Costa had his best game for LA Galaxy, which is a shame that he got sent off because you saw that when it all comes together in the manner in which Vanny wants to play, it was like a symphony. Yep. It was beautiful mm-hmm. against the team that they've really struggled against. Yep. That was a landmark result for this football club in a time where they've had a really topsy-turvy, who are you kind of season. I thought the goals were great, Josh. I loved the game and I felt like, hmm, are they playing like they've got nothing to lose now? So we're going to see these kinds of performances. Which is crazy to think because they have a lot to lose, right? I mean, they have the the chance to miss the playoffs again. Maybe you could say that they're outside the playoffs, so all they could do was go up. But I, I really feel like there was a tremendous amount of pressure on them, especially after the, the previous Vancouver game. But there's a tremendous amount of pressure on them to win that game. Um, and they but, did it but with But they played ease. it without... The, it, it just felt different the way they came out. You know, the not going down... They're not conceding first. They're holding the lead together. They're not capitulating in the second half or making it like one of those edge of your seat finishes. Right. And I think that's where I mean they they played like they had nothing to lose. Of course, you know, the stakes are high. Yeah. But their attitude was totally different. It, it's, again, I found this, and, and you said, I, I love that you said this in the press conference whenever you talked to Greg, you said, it was fun to watch. Like, yeah. like, like, hey, coach, it was fun to watch. And and you're right, because so often, and this is where I get, this is where I enjoy what I do so much, which is I get to watch live soccer. And sometimes, every once in a while, maybe not all the time, I get to see unbelievable games that are just, they mm-hmm. defy logic or they're just played so well. I mean, the Galaxy, in terms of their ability to unlock Colorado, and I think Colorado played poorly, but I also think the LA Galaxy played so far above them in terms of pace and skill and thought that Colorado looked like they were traffic cones a lot of times because they were trying to react to things that had already happened three or four steps ahead, which we haven't really locked in with the LA Galaxy. Occasionally, we'll see that mm-hmm. where they're able to play so far ahead in terms of the thinking. You know, the the biggest example of that is just Grand Sear getting the ball and then the outside of the foot into Brugman. Well, Brugman had already taken off by the time Grand Sear got that ball and turned. Brugman was already moving. And so Grand Sear turned around to look at him already moving. And it was like, yeah, of course I'm going to play it there. Right. It was like it was already predetermined that that's where the ball was going to go when Grand Sear got it and turned. But he saw it and he made it happen. And how often do we see the Galaxy see those runs and pass it backwards or pass it sideways or not be sure about where the person is going to be, or where the run is going to be? Um, yeah, the Greg said that a lot to you as well, isn't it? Because you, you've asked him a lot of questions about the movement and kind of tactically the the naivety sometimes in the team when it comes to you can have all the possession in the world. You can move all you want, but if you don't create anything out of it at the end, yeah, what's the point? And that's what he'd seen a lot of. And I like that question that you kind of lobbed at him because I think you said, is this one of those moments where the part, the movement made the pass? Yeah. But it yeah. was a sensational pass, let's great. be honest. It was great. It was I, great I, I, those are my favorite types of plays. I mean, you can... I loved, uh, like for goals wise, you can love Raheem Edwards and the individual effort that he put out in order to score the goal. And then if you mm-hmm. go into, but for me, like the better goals that I liked was the grand third pass to Brookman or the one where Costa gets the ball and dishes it out to Araujo and Araujo sends in the the, the perfect that cross great. to Chicho and Chicho with the half pirouette turn in the score. The, those are the, because it's all so Everybody knew exactly where everybody was while they were doing it. So it's you can't see it while you're playing it, but you know where they mm-hmm. are. And so the passes hit everybody knowing where they are. 
Um, and that's stuff that has to be learned and in a system and you have to play next to people. And as you said, Douglas Costa was the best version of himself. Here's the, this is a question, and one of the the uh, Edgar over at uh, News Across the Galaxy, the Nag Boys, um, who I love, uh, he, he DM'd me, and we were going back and forth because we talk a little bit about the galaxy here and there. We were talking about it, and he goes, "If you could only, if you had to keep one, Douglas Costa or Kevin Cabral for next year, you have to keep one. You don't get to get rid of both of them. You have to keep one. Which one do you keep?" And the hard part is that with the ending for Douglas Costa, which is the unnecessary red card that really didn't help. And by the way, we'll probably hurt the Galaxy against the San Jose game. I'm very convinced that the Greg Vanny would have started the 4 through 3 We'll talk about that with Douglas Costa. Mm -hmm. Like repeat lineup coming outside of probably uh, Casares, who's, who's going to be off on international duty. Uh, I would expect a repeat lineup and I would expect Douglas Costa there. And you have all this momentum that's being built and then Costa gets a red card. And part of me seeing the first half of that is like, I was ready to write Costa off. And part of me was like, maybe I bring Costa back. Maybe that's the answer. Maybe I bring Costa back. Do you trust him for 34 games next season? You didn't get much out of him in 34 games this season. Do you trust that he has now figured it out in 34 games? And we saw one or two little bright spots from him all. And I'm still like, if you had to pick one, and then I, I eventually told, uh, told Edgar, I'm like, this is why I'm not paid to make those decisions because I don't know what I would choose right now. If you had to choose and bring back one, right? There's part of me who's just like, wipe the slate. <laughs> interesting point you made about 34 games, right? Well, Cabral hasn't shown up for a lot of the games that he's played Correct. in. And I get the, the narrative that Vanny wants to sell about his movement off the ball. Eventually, though, you've got to be able to do something when you have the ball. And... You could argue that the position that they're in, or for all that Vanny's been kind of waxing lyrical about his movement off the ball, look at the position the team are in. Hasn't really helped because the efficiency in the final third of the pitch is non-existent. He is whiffed on so many chances. Yep. So would I take Costa right. for six or seven games? <laughs> for six or seven games, yes. And yeah. maybe get three points right. versus Cabral, who I just think has been a big dud. Yeah. I think he's, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be disrespectful in I, any way. I don't way, think you are. I don't is. think you are. I don't, I, I, I don't think at this point, that's sort of the reason that, I, you know, I, I've been theorizing that the Galaxy very much could wipe the slate clean with Chicha's contract up with uh, Cabral, you could probably probably loan him out somewhere and get him off your roster so that way you could fill that young DP spot with another one or you move some other U22 players so that way you only need one U22 player. You know, you could sell Julian Araujo, you could move uh, Efrain Alvarez and you could be then have three senior designated players and only need that one U22 spot. And so you could get, you could buy out Costa so you loan Cabral, buy out Costa, and Chicha's contract is gone. So that's three open designated player spots. You can do that. I would love to see, like this is Ricky's team now. For as long as he wants to stay in LA, this yes. is Ricky's. This is Ricky's team. Build mm -hmm. around him. That's yep. what you're doing for the future. That's who you're building around. To see him and Brugeman and um, Delgado, you know, behind him, and then you've got three open DP spots in attack in attacking positions, especially. I mean, yeah, my, hello, yeah. LA Galaxy fans. Are you salivating right now? Because I'm sure you are. I, the, the other part about that is, though... But keep Araujo. Sorry. Yeah. I wanted to add that. Okay. Well, I, I, I like that. I like your idea about keeping Araujo. There's, there's part of me that says that if Ricky Push keeps playing the way that he's going to keep playing, that you're going to have to basically DP him eventually, right? Like, maybe you get one 100%. more year. Maybe you only get half a year at TAM, and you're going to have to make him a designated player in the summertime. Like, I just don't know how... Eventually, somebody's going to call and offer him a lot more money, and you're going to have to like oh, yeah. you, you have to be like you have to go, Ricky, because we can't pay you that much money, that type of thing. But maybe you can prolong it a little bit. Maybe he can raise his status. And listen, people are paying attention to him. Flat out, people are paying attention to him right now. If you've watched any of the um, the league's cup that is going on, major league soccer teams are basically even sometimes with subs outperforming the Liga MX teams, and. I was just telling Hammer, I was texting Hammer in the group chat before I came over. I said, MLS teams are making Liga MX teams look like they're regressing. And I go, and I don't think that they are, I don't think MLS teams are getting that much better that they are actually like really topping Liga MX. 
But from what I've seen and how like some of these teams have played, it's either Liga MX isn't taking it seriously, which is always a possibility. Even some MLS teams are taking it seriously, but playing backups and subs and all these other things that are going on. Or the status of MLS is really rising and that we're sort of like a frog in a, in a, in a pot of water and it's slowly starting to boil type thing where we are so far inside it, we can't really acknowledge the monumental gains that are happening just here in North America between MLS mm -hmm. and League MX. And so for me, that signals that MLS could possibly be on its way to really starting to shine a light on, on this league and, you know, have more focus on it from around the world. And if that's the case, then guys like Ricky are just the beginning um but ricky is a supreme talent the galaxy got uh got brugman and they got ricky and with those two uh as somebody i think in our discord said which was i think 100 percent off with those two they've been able to basically make up for the lack of of or only having like one and a half dps that the la galaxy have <laughs> have sort of been playing with so far yeah, I agree with you on the evolution. Look, every league goes through peaks and troughs, but the evolution of Major League Soccer is really, it's not even at its peak at all. It's just getting started. And this is why I love Simon Cooper's book, Soconomics, which refers to the US market as an emerging market and mm -hmm. one that could be at the tippy top of the mountain one day. When you see the captain of Napoli and still an international player come to Toronto in Signia, I think they signed two other internationals um, who play for Italy. When you're seeing that younger profile player come over, you're seeing a Ricky uh, leave Barcelona to come and get his shot here because they know that the profile and the window um, and the DNA of like playing in MLS is looked upon completely differently now. Araujo has been linked to teams in Europe. Um, we've seen, of course, you know, other players go out there. But definitely, I think you've seen that in... I know the, the All-Star game sometimes isn't taken as seriously, but you've right. seen that evolution in the All-Star game as well. So I totally concur with you on that one. Just really, really interesting. I've, I've been a big fan of, uh, of Ricky. One of, one of the guys in our, our uh, John in our group chat said... Remember when the LA Galaxy were looking for a cam, right? Remember whenever they were like, oh man, they need a central attacking midfielder. And then Ricky comes in and you're like, okay, that's done now. Box checked, checked, you know, and, and sort of moved over. I really like the 4-3-3. I like Ricky playing more advanced. Um, I like the speed at which the LA Galaxy were able to attack. I think that uh, whenever they go up to San Jose, I think it's likely that, that Cabral just slots into the Douglas Costa spot. There's other solutions, but you can't put Jovalic as a forward or a winger in that same spot. Might put Efrain Alvarez. We can talk a little bit about that more, but um, just some interesting stuff. I, I still don't know, and I've now had a week basically to think about it, Sophie. I still don't know if I trust this LA Galaxy team and what we saw against Colorado because so far we've seen them play well and then back off and play poorly again. Um, and they're on the road um, in, in a really, really monumental game whenever you realize what it could do for them um, should they be victorious. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, basically if the Galaxy win against San Jose, they they more or less have locked up a spot. They may not clinch it. They can't clinch until RSL, um, the RSL game. But if they got three points, it would put them in fifth place, uh, jumping two teams. It would do a lot of things to getting them there. And then possibly even a draw against RSL is enough to lock in a spot. And heaven, I mean, let's you want to talk pie in the sky, right? They They beat San Jose. They beat RSL they're flirting for possibly a fourth spot depending on really what happens. Although I think Nashville's far enough ahead that, that everything is probably there, but that's how they almost could have a home game in the playoffs. If they play well over the next three games, that's crazy stupid to think about. So we won't think about <laughs> it because this, you've gone. I love it. I be, love this as well. Because this is, and, and the reason that it's crazy is that the galaxy have not won more than two games in a row under Greg Vanny. It's, ne it's they've never won three. They've gone unbeaten, and the unbeaten streak was was a fun one to sort of watch. But that wasn't that's not th winning three in a row, um, and so that's that is you know, a shocking stat. They would have, I mean, if you want to see them get crazy, they would have to win like the last four games of the season, um, and that would put them very much likely in one. It would guarantee a playoff spot. I can already guarantee you get a playoff spot if you win the next four games. That's not hard. I've been I've been spouting off the one out theory forever. You will be a playoff team. <laughs> Um, especially with the Galaxy above the line right now. Um, but the bottom uh, line me, is they could they could technically really move up the standings if they just get hot right now. Let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 
every Galaxy fan would take getting to MLS Cup final, winning it, of course, then having Philly or LAFC season right now. You take you take that. Yep. What LA Galaxy reminded me of and why I changed my mind about whether or not they can make the playoffs after that Colorado game is they reminded me of the two New York Giants teams that Eli Manning was quarterback of that went to the Super Bowl, especially the first year where Strahan was still in the team. Totally cold, you know, um, didn't really have a great season, but wild card won. Go away from home, win. Go away from home again, win. All of a sudden, they're putting together this run, this belief. They've got the talent. They just were really poor during the season. Before you know it, they get to the final and they're beating Tom Brady and then they do it again. There's something about this team that has always had the talent, Mm -hmm. but maybe lacked the belief and maybe lacked a little of miscommunication between manager and players because I don't think you can play that poorly throughout the season and then not be some type of misunderstanding. Yeah. So there's something about them, Josh, that leads me to believe, like, once they get there, I don't think a lot of teams are going to want to play them in that 4-3-3 system that you're talking about with a fit Costa playing the way they did against the Rapids in the playoffs. Yeah, I should say, news-wise, Damian Calhoun tweeted out that, that Douglas Costa would only miss the one game. We were fairly convinced that the disciplinary committee was going to tack on another game because usually whenever you hit somebody in the face, and yes, you can say he, he pushed him in the face, but he did reach out he and was do an something idiot. to his face. Yeah, it was stupid. I still can't believe there's people. I just saw another Facebook post being like, Douglas Costa got Grand Sears back. Do you need to have Grand Sears back? Does, did, did he look like he was in trouble for any reason? Do you think Grand Sears is not a tough player? That he can't handle his own business? It's like, and are you up for nothing? We've already, I said this on Monday, but are you up for nothing? You know what happens whenever somebody goes over and pushes one of your guys and you're up for nothing? You point at the scoreboard and you go, hey, we're winning for nothing. Stop yeah. it. Like, you know, there's there's ways to handle it. So he didn't. And now he's going to be missing for the San Jose game talking about like sort of this monumental thing. So uh, but the the word that Damian Calhoun had, and I imagine that he got this. He didn't say specifically. I imagine he got this from uh, from Greg Vanny was that Douglas Costa was only going to miss the one game, which means he'll be back for the RSL game. Um, I'm still I'll, I'll wait for the disciplinary committee uh, notes to come out. And basically it will show. Uh, they can still go all the way into next week and suspend him for another game. But I imagine that that when Damien said that, it was only going to be the one game. I'll, I'll, I'll try to clarify with him and get more info on that. So, Well, this is one of those instances, too, where in the interest of the league, you want your major players playing in these matches, right? And, you know, I'm not saying that because these things happen and we've seen other teams get away with stuff like this. Yeah. So let's see. Yeah. Um, for me... Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in the San Jose game. There's just, there's, let's go over the, the guys who are going to be missing. So we already talked about Jalen Neal and Marcus for Now, again, those guys aren't necessarily for is on loan to, to Phoenix rising, uh, Jalen Neal playing down with G2. Those guys were both up with the USU twenties, I believe. Um, so they've been playing and then we knew about, um, Martin Caceres and we were sort of like, oh, okay. Um, you know, he's going to be, he's going to be out and, I, I theorized that Zavaleta and Leardam might uh, be there, and I, I didn't say it the last show. So Zavaleta and Leardam also gone on international. All three of these players will miss the 924 game. They'll be back for the RSL game. Okay, so this is remember this is like the last 180 minutes most teams have, Sophie, before the World Cup. Right, you get two games, then the, then the World Cup in Qatar. This is it. We are our final countdown. So if you're excited, like I, I'm okay. So I very much do not like the fact that there's a World Cup in the winter, but I'm very yeah. much looking forward to the fact there will not be Major League Soccer being played and I can watch the World Cup unencumbered by any sort of need to cover or to watch for any particular reason. Or I'm just going to get to enjoy it. And the Black Friday game between the U.S. and England is possibly going to be better than Christmas this year. I just I think that that's just such a wonderful way to spend the day after Thanksgiving. I am so pumped about it. Um that I, I have I think, a horrible feeling about that game. I like the fact that you already have a horrible feeling about that game. I don't know which I, team which way you're leading on that. I I would imagine that you're a 3 Lions fan over over the a US fan. I mean um, it has to be on um, um you know part of me. <laughs> and I I agree. But let's be honest. Doesn't that game scream draw to you just like it no, was the last time? No, it actually screams England are so cocky and arrogant about these kinds of games. 
And I love the exchange on the Champions League show with uh, Clint Dempsey and Jamie Carragher, where Jamie Carragher said, oh, 4-0. And Clint Dempsey's like, dude, you want to rethink that, dude? Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. type of thing. And um, I just, uh, I think Amer the America likes to draw against England. But yeah, no, I, I, think, I think the U.S. are going to get a sensational result. I don't feel good about that game and haven't felt good about that game since I saw the draw. The one game. Uh, anyway, so uh, th that'll be going on. So we'll, we'll be able to do that. This is these are those games that basically are leading up to these um, to these World Cups. So there's teams playing friendlies and all that stuff. So that's what you see from that. The other news I sort of wanted to touch on before we jump over and start covering some some other things um, is the 22 under 22. I just wanted to point out again to LA Galaxy players. I don't think anybody's su surprised by the two LA Galaxy players that are there. Julian Araujo, uh, number five, highest LA Galaxy player, and Efrain Alvarez, number 17. So these are basically players who are 21 and don't turn 22, I think. Or was it 22? Hold on, I have the list in front of me. They gave the actual um, age cutoff. Players had to remain 21 or younger before the end of the MLS regular season. So uh, basically, they must have been born on or after October 10th, 2000. Um, which is scary because that makes me really old whenever they start putting little dates like that next makes to things. you old. Yeah, hey, you still you still look good. I'm just getting sort of pudgy and round the edges, okay? It's it's not the tan, the light is hiding the the exhaustion that is coming from having a two and a half year old who is sassy. He is the <laughs> sassiest two and a half year old. Good lord. Um, so anyway. Uh so that's I, I don't know what to make of that. I'll tell you this: Efrain Alvarez dropped on the list from last year, um, and I think Julian Rajo. I think he stayed around the same. Somebody will correct me. I forget. I looked it up at one point, and then I forgot to write it down. So um, it wasn't one of those shocking things for me. But these are the guys that I think there's going to be a market for coming up, Sophie, in the off season this winter. I think Julian Rajo will be shopped. Um, because I think that there are people knocking on the door for him. Um, I think Efrain Alvarez. It's time to sell. There's a difference between those two. It's time to sell Efrain Alvarez. You're going to get good offers for Julian Araujo. Um, and so apparently there was even, there's a lot of rumors out there, and I don't know how the true they are, that Efrain Alvarez basically asked out of the LA Galaxy and wants to go um, and was was ready to go on loan. And I think uh, Chivas in, in Guadalajara was ready to take him on loan, and the Galaxy are like, no, 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 you don't get him on loan. You can buy him, but you don't get him on loan. And if you're thinking about the reason behind that is if you send Efrain Alvarez on loan to Liga MX, Sophie, there's very little chance that he's going to increase his value while he's there, right? At least in my eyes. So that's why you need to sell him because you want his value to be as high as you can keep it right now with the LA Galaxy. And then you sell him. And if he goes and performs the way I imagine he's going to play, his value is going to drop very quickly um, yeah. in Liga MX. I, I agree with you. I could... I can see that it's time for him to be moved on. I would like to see a Raho play with, like I said, you know, really superior attacking players. Right. Just to see what that season looks like with Ricky and the other two in, in the midfield. I would like to see that. I think he can wait another year and still have maximum value, maybe more value. Yeah, um, it's... I talked to him. Um, I went to training a couple weeks ago, and he was one of the guys we were talking to. Uh, and I was talking to him beforehand, before we started, because he was hanging out. We were waiting for everybody to get there. It was, it was one of those situations, one of those sometimes weird situations whenever we don't do it on the field. It was so hot outside. Everybody, We did it inside. It was one of those. Mm -hmm. And Julian was there, and so we were sort of just talking back and forth. And I'm like, and so he even answered the question afterwards. But I asked him, I'm like, so... I go, are you getting like interest from this? He goes, I don't know. He goes, you know, that's, I leave that stuff for my agent. He goes, I imagine people are calling, you know, holding it. It's like, okay, you know, that sort of makes sense. Um, and he said, but right now I'm under contract with the LA Galaxy. And not only that, but he's under contract for a significant number of years with the LA Galaxy because that was one of the things that Dennis DeCloso did with Efrain Alvarez and Julian Araujo was to lock them in under the U22 contracts for, a, for a, a number of years. And that now means that the Galaxy hold full control over who they're going to sell to and how much they're going to get instead of having to like panic, get rid of somebody because their contract is up in a year. Um, so wasn't bad that Dennis, was he? I, I am. I'm a big fan of Dennis close. Everybody knows that. Uh, I'm definitely, definitely a fan of, uh, of, of the guy who's now in charge of uh, fan Nord uh, over in, uh, in the Netherlands. So it's pretty cool to think that the guy who was in charge of the LA galaxy uh, was went and moved up like in the world of football. And is now, I think like the, 
he's not GM, but I think he's president of Feyenoord. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's kind of cool. And and yeah, I can doing really well. And I can text the president of Feyenoord, and like I get responses back. So like it's kind of cool. Like, hey, can I come visit? Type thing. <laughs> Do can I, do you have an extra room in the Netherlands so I, I can go, you know, those types of things. But no, uh, Dennis was always very nice <laughs> to this show. So uh, he's been great. And anytime you have questions about stuff, he's usually pretty happy. And some of that was he, uh, Feyenoord bought Cole Bassett from Colorado. Um, mm-hmm. And I was that was like one of those. And like, you know, you scouted them, you saw them and they bought them. And then they loaned them out. But they think he's going to be good enough that eventually he's going to make it onto the, the first team of Feyenoord. So it's kind of cool just to see all the inner workings and how MLS transfers over to the Netherlands oh, really? and, and all that different stuff. So lots of, uh, lots of interesting stuff. All right. Um, goodbye, by the way. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I think so. Uh, points to the playoffs, 48 points. Oh, here we go. Look at that. 48 points is what we're targeting. Galaxy currently have 43 points. Sophie, that means if we do our, our very simplistic arithmetic, uh, the maths, as you would say, uh, across the pond, um, you would see uh, uh, five points needed for the LA Galaxy. Three games remaining, that means nine total points, so the Galaxy need to capture slightly more than half the points in order to get to the magic 48 points. I don't know if that 48 is going to hold up. It seems likely that it will. I think the 48 is still really good. It could end up being 47. It could end up being 46. Uh, I don't think it's going to cross into 49 or 50. But uh, that's sort of where I, I think we're sitting right now with this Galaxy team and sort of how they're playing. Um, I think 48 is the, still the magic number, and 48 may get them into sixth or even fifth, uh, the way everything's sort of shaping out. So we'll see how it all goes. I think there's going to be a couple teams that finish like fifth, sixth, and seventh, and they're all going to be either one point separated from each other or like they're all going to be tied on the same number of points with like tiebreakers. Um, mm-hmm. That's how it's sort goal of goal difference. Goal difference right now is in Galaxy's favor. Yeah, it right? goes. It goes wins first. Yeah. So number of wins is your first tiebreaker, and then goal difference. So let's bring up the um, the Galaxy in the Western Conference and sort of see where everybody stands in terms of that. Uh, Galaxy at thirty one games. Almost every other team outside of Seattle and San Jose. Is that right? Yep. Seattle and San Jose are uh, are on thirty two. So the Galaxy will play. San Jose, uh, that'll get them to 32 and San Jose to 32. And I forget who Seattle plays. I think they play an Eastern Conference team um, in order to get themselves to uh, to the 32. Um, so everybody will be on 32 points basically by Tuesday um, or 32 games. And then we will see where sort of the points lay out. And this is why the LA Galaxy can jump some teams. You can very simply see that with the LA Galaxy right now at 43 points, Portland is at 46 points. Should the LA Galaxy get three points against San Jose, that would jump them over San, over Minnesota and over Portland, and that would put them in, and they would have the tiebreaker on Portland because of the wins. The Galaxy would have 13 wins to Portland's 11 wins. Nobody else is playing, so it's really easy to do the math on this one. You don't have to worry about what Portland does. Portland's not playing this weekend. Just the Galaxy, just San Jose, um, and Seattle on that side. So... Again. This, this is perfect vintage LA Galaxy showpiece game. No one else is playing. You know, lay down your marker, win the match. You that's, know, that's it's it. center of attention, under the spotlight. Um, no excuses. It's in your control again. And and the the thing is, and this is why I say this is a very important game for the Galaxy and maybe the most consequential game the Galaxy will play. At least it could be, depending on what they do in it. Um, and it's not a must win is because if the Galaxy don't win, they stay in the exact same spot. Nothing else changes, right? So they're still above the playoff line going against RSL. The RSL game then would be the most consequential game that the Galaxy could play. But obviously getting any points at this juncture um, is important because it's going to move you up. Even a point, it's not great. But it could separate you from RSL. It could be the difference sort of, uh, you know, against some of these other teams. So any point is okay. I really, really think that the LA Galaxy have to be playing for three on this one. This is one of those that three points is super. I don't know if Greg Van, if you're, if it's one one in the 85th minute, are you just going to sit on it and be, we got five minutes, take the point and you do it. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, no, because Salt Lake and Houston are better teams. I mean, the, and, and this is a Cali Classico, right. which adds a whole other layer of mayonnaise to the equation, the doesn't st- it, really? The stats are absolutely 100% against the LA Galaxy in this game. The the history, the stadium, everything is against the Galaxy yeah. in this game. There's The likelihood, the fact that they are going to be favored in this game cracks me up. 
Uh, they are. They're heavily favored in this game, which is hysterical. But by standings, you would expect it. Uh, and as people have rightfully said so far in the chat room, is they said the Galaxy often played down to their opponent. Well, they didn't against Colorado. And that gives you some hope that perhaps maybe they have learned something. Uh, by the way, a $2 super chat from way back. Uh, what that gave us a $2 super chat says, this is money for Josh's love of Stanford Stadium. Yet the stadium I absolutely hate. Uh, there's another stadium I don't like very much either. Um, and people are sort of well aware of that one, but that one hits a lot closer to home. So people are a little more angry about that one. <laughs> I really don't like the Rose Bowl. And people people are like, really? The Rose Bowl? You don't like that? I, I despise the Rose Bowl. I absolutely well, especially despise driving it. into it. Driving it into, just, driving uh, out of, getting there, even just to try to get there. The stadium is, you know, it's a really nice old stadium, but it's yeah. an old stadium that needs a ton of work to it to actually be what I would consider a feasible modern stadium anymore. Um, so for me, so uh, I like the open press boxes. I do. I, I tend to like it. I don't because what happens whenever you get the glass and everything in front of you, it, it gets quiet. It's like, yeah, you it's can very hear a pin quiet. Drive. You can hear a pin. Yeah. Drive. Go, go. Uh, if you ever couple the game game at uh, up in Seattle, it's very quiet because it's glass and it's very yeah. quiet. And if you go to Rose Bowl, it's very quiet. You go to Stanford so as well. You go to Stanford so Stadium. For such a... Yeah, so you go to Stanford Stadium. It's very quiet. And they have yeah. like discount granite on top of the countertops like they got it at Home Depot. And to me I'm like just don't have granite if you're going to go like Home Depot granite because uh... that's not the same. Maybe <clears throat> maybe it's a first world problem, who knows. Um but yeah. the these are the types of things. This is this is why this game becomes important and how you can make this game one of the most important for the LA Galaxy. Three points really does basically lock them into the playoffs almost regardless of what happens with RSL, but you'd have to watch what happens there in against RSL. If you get a point against RSL, it's probably enough to lock you into the playoffs. Yeah, this is where this team needs to turn the corner. So when I said this is kind of like an old school, an old school, you know, Nakeen and Donovan Beckham days type of you know, backs against the wall, us against the world. That's kind of like the LA Galaxy mentality because, of course, a lot of jealousy comes with having five stars on the shirt. And I feel like this is a turning point for this team to really show character, which they haven't shown a lot of this season. In spurts, they have, but they haven't done a lot of that this season. And now's the time to change those numbers, shift those gears. Look, you, you beat Colorado Rapids. Yep. A major result, turning point. Yep. Can you carry that on and go up there and get a result? There's something about these misfits <laughs> that have come together as a team somewhat in the last few games. <laughs> it's, right? it's like the A team. It's like you gather them all together and there's a plan and they go out and they and somehow they're able. The, the, what is it? The parts are greater. Is it the sum is greater than the, the parts? The sum is greater the, than yes. all the parts. Yes, the sum is greater than all the parts. I, mm. I think. You, you can feel that sometimes, and sometimes you feel like the parts are just horrible and they don't fit at all. And it's a clock that the gears are just grinding in. Um, and 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 if you see as Greg, you know, I, I think I followed up with I don't know, I can't remember if it was me or someone else, but to not see that, to have that, and to know they can play like that. And that they haven't played like that. Mm. But then also that he's made mistakes sticking with certain players and trusting them to the point now where I think he realizes, man, I've trusted a few guys maybe too long, too mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so well, I mean, I mean, look this at is Doug the moment. This is, this is your perfect example of that, though, is Douglas Costa. Douglas Costa got benched after the Sporting Kansas City game, rightfully so. Um, mm -hmm. They went away to Sporting Kansas City. He destroyed the game plan. Vanny basically told us that after the game because I asked him specifically, like, what did you want to see out of Douglas Costa? And he was basically like, not what I saw. And then he didn't start. And he didn't start for a little while. And then something happened in training. Greg mm -hmm. Vanny saw something in Douglas Costa and was sort of like, okay, he's back. This is the guy I wanted. This is the guy I need. He's buying in. I'm going to give him another chance. And since that, he's played actually pretty well. Do you so, remember at the beginning of the season where I said to you, where you asked me about him, and I said he could end up being a great – I put all my – chips on the table with him and i was ready to eat humble pie and i still think humble pie is coming maybe who knows right but i also said to you that a six seventy percent fit douglas costa i would take over a hundred percent fit cabral if i get that kind of game out of him or if i just get a few games out of him like that because that was a different level of football it was that we saw it was 
that was top level MLS soccer that was played against the Colorado Rapids. Mm-hmm. Colorado didn't have an answer for any of it. No, they, and I don't want to hear that narrative of, oh, Colorado was so bad. This is a team that LA Galaxy have struggled against for a long time to get results. And that was a massive game. And they absolutely annihilated them. And from start to finish, the, the goal was just, they should never have let that goal in, that consolation goal. Well, I mean, they destroyed them. I mean, you know, hey, play for 10 men for the last 30 minutes of the game and figure out what, you know, that's, that's what, and yes, you can defend against it and try to let them the goals and do all that stuff. And yes, it's an excuse. But bottom line Fair is, enough. if the Galaxy go 11 11, they don't score that goal. No, no way. In fact, I think it goes to maybe another couple goals. Yeah, could, could, Galaxy. Could perhaps yeah i mean i don't think the galaxy were ready to sort of take their foot off the uh, off the no. gas there um i did a little searching just of the la galaxy just to tell you how crazy this team has been this year um i'm going to tell you the positive stuff first we'll end on the negative because that's always more fun it'll make you think about it a little harder uh six games uh in six games through the 31 games they, they have played they have scored mm. three or more goals so the galaxy have scored three or more goals six times this season that's actually pretty good big number i mean it's not philadelphia number who scored like you know more than three goals in their last 12 games or something like that but they were racking up how many of those games have they won scoring three goals i believe all of them all of them right Mm, there was one wasn't a four three was there a three three or there was a three three (laughs) there was a three three in the 25th game and i don't have who it was against i don't remember who it was but there was a three three um let's see four one so three one four one four oh five two three three and four one okay this a lot of goals. Yeah, scored a lot of goals. So in those six games, um, you know, basically uh, they've they've scored three goals or more. In the last eight, the three of those games have come in the last eight games for the LA Galaxy. So the three times in the last eight games they've scored three or more goals. Now let's get to the bad part. Uh, goals against mm. nine games, the Galaxy have allowed three goals or more. Nine times. There's well. a. Th- there's a 3-2, there's a 3-1, there's a 3-0, there's a 3-2, there's a 3-2, there's a 3-2. That's their favorite, by the way. If you want to know which score the LA Galaxy are going to lose by uh, to San Jose on Saturday night, I would pick 3-2. If you're going to pick them to lose, they're going to lose 3-2. They won't win 3-2, they will lose 3-2. Because that's sort of been the history of the, this LA Galaxy team. Uh, 3-2, 3-2, 3-2, 4-2, 3-3, uh, and then 3 uh, most recently to Vancouver. So again very hit and miss and Mm -hmm. uh, Vanny told this to us after the game he said this team maybe hangs on the results of the last game too much sometimes right like he said basically like sometimes we buy in too much like oh my god we're so good (laughs) look at us 4-1 we are amazing and then some of it is oh my god we're the worst team in the world we lost three nothing probably we think they're emotional right is what the word that he he said it so many times I don't know if everybody I mean, people talk about maturity, and I think that I think the the chat is sort of saying, you know, it's an immature team. Like just the way they behave is immature. I think the emotional thing is too much. They they are they're too they're too. Oh, good job. I don't know if they're immature. I think there's a naivety to them. I liken it to Arsenal. They've got a young team, and they're mature for young players. Like they don't go out and get in trouble. They don't get in trouble like Foden and Grealish and stuff like that. But there's a naivety to the way they play sometimes. Yeah. Like, you could have got a point at Old Trafford, but the manager and the team were naive. And I think Vanny's been naive, too. It's not just the players. Right. And it's it's his responsibility to kind of manage that process as as in his position. And I, I think he's somewhat done that towards the end of the season, but it's not been consistent enough from him to get yeah. them to that spot. You know how you fix that, right? You, you win winning. Ga- you win games. This yeah. it solves everything. It's amazing. I love I love winning. Winning fixes everything. It, do- yeah. it doesn't matter what happened to you. And, and look, by the way, if- it fixes fans too. I would like to say, like, if, like they they're so angry and ornery all the time whenever the Galaxy lose, and then they win in a four one in Colorado, and everybody has a good weekend. The Discord is quiet. Nobody has to come in and like complain. <laughs> I'm just like, good. Everybody enjoy your weekend. Like, have a good one. You know, have have fun. Have fun. Some of those things. So yeah, yeah. That's. And, and maybe they're, they're finding this form. I mean, it's not been great, but it was great. The last game was great. No one can deny them that at the right time of the season. As, this uh, is when you really need to win and, and get into great form. This is the point as, of everything. As, as Hammer has said, Sophie, don't peak too soon, right? But maybe they're peaking at the right time. Maybe yeah, this there's is no, it. 
Yeah, this is now you've got a peak. It's time. I it's mean, time to peak. It's, it's time to peak. It's time to peak. There's, <laughs> there's no going back now. Now's the time to peak. Like, let's get it going. Uh, all right. We look at the Galaxy <clears throat> schedule, and I know we've sort of talked about it already with three games. It's kind of easy to remember. San Jose away. Uh, then it's home to RSL on October 1st. That's a 7.30 p.m. game. And then Decision Day, 2 p.m. on 10.9. So that is it. That wraps up the season. Wraps up very early. Um, because of the World Cup that's coming, everything has to be wrapped up before. So we we slog through all of those games, Sophie. And if you go back and look at how many games the Galaxy played per month, you can you can remember the slog that it has been. And July had six games, and I think didn't July even have seven games because they had or August. Yeah, I guess July was yeah, brutal. Yeah, July was brutal, and they had like a friendly, and there was some Open Cup games in here as well. And so the little things, so you can see it starting to sort of wrap up and how it's going. And one more game left for this month. That's the San Jose game, um, and then just two games remaining in October, and that is it. That's all she wrote. The LA Galaxy will either be in the playoffs, they won't be in the playoffs, there will be postseason play, there won't be postseason play. It is coming to a head very quickly, and I think if you're the LA Galaxy, knowing that if you win the next two games, Sophie, that Houston game matters less in terms of it would matter more towards seeding, perhaps, than it would towards actually being in the playoffs. You should, if you win the next two games, clinch a spot in the playoffs. And like I said, depending on results, I think even maybe one point against RSL and three against San Jose would do it. Now, that's all nice and fine. And we've been talking about rainbows and unicorns of the LA Galaxy getting three points against the San Jose Earthquakes. But let's pump the brakes here for a little bit. The San Jose Earthquakes, this game coming up at uh, Stanford Stadium, stupid Stanford Stadium, Stanford Stadium, uh, coming up, Spectrum Sportsnet, LAGalaxy.com is where you can find that game. Good thing, because I'll be in Colorado. Um, September 24th, and that game is at 7 p.m. Uh, kickoff is at 7.08 p.m. That's the game. Uh, Joe and Kobe and Nikki on the call, so you'll be ready for that whenever it comes up. Uh, they travel to Stanford Stadium. This is the makeup game for the game that got canceled whenever the fires took out the power system to Stanford, and therefore they didn't have power to the stadium. So having said that, this is the latest in the year, Sophie, the LA Galaxy have ever played at Stanford Stadium. I would like I would, I, <laughs> I would like to point out <laughs> that for the most part, the previous latest they ever played at San Jose Stadium was July 1st. All right. So that's how far. Ooh. And the earliest I think they've ever played at Stanford Stadium was June 26th. OK, so they always play in this like one week window that's right before July 4th. They usually play San Jose and then they come home and play their July 4th game. That's usually how all of these go. So um, really interesting. Now, let's get to the records real quick. LA Galaxy. I like what you're selling. Yeah, I like what you're selling. 12, 12 and 7, 43 points. San Jose, 7, 14 and 10, 31 points. Uh, if we look at the home record for San Jose, they actually have one of the better home records in terms of least losses in all of Major League Soccer. 6-3-6 six, and six for 24 points. The LA Galaxy at home are 8-5-3 and three for 27 points. So really, what if the San Jose would win this game, they would have the same number of points at home as the LA Galaxy do. The problem with San Jose has not been home. It has been away. Um, and they are one win 11 losses and four draws on the road. So when you understand San Jose and they just played Dallas and Dallas went down a man, it was a one, one draw and all this stuff, but San Jose has been good at home. Now, Sophie, the good news is they're not playing at home. They're playing at Stanford stadium. So that is different because this is not PayPal park where they normally play in their friendly confines. They don't play anybody else, but the LA galaxy at Stanford stadium. So it's going to be different for them. I think that's, I think that matters. I don't know if it matters. So um, that's something in there. Um, they are winless in their last three San Jose galaxy, two wins in their last seven games, technically. So I don't know that you could sit there and say, Oh, well, the LA galaxy have been so much better than San Jose mm, They're closer than you think they are. Uh, the last win for, um, San Jose came earlier in September, September 4th uh, uh, versus Vancouver at home to nothing win that type of thing. Uh, Jeremy Obubuse, um, 16 goals, Christian Espinosa, 13 assists. They have some guys who can put the ball in the back of the net. Now, are you ready to hear? I went and looked up all the games played at Stanford Stadium because I was like, I know it's not a good result for the Galaxy. I knew that going in because I don't remember too many games where you're like, oh man, the Galaxy, absolutely, they're so good at Stanford. You know, the whole day, that's, that's not the case in all this. So um, a total of, let's see, uh, nine games 
played at Stanford Stadium so far, and that started in 2012. So June 30th of 2012 was the first time that those two teams that I have, at least, that I could find, uh, played at Stanford Stadium. It was a 4-3 win for the San Jose Earthquakes. Um, 6-29 in 2013 was a 3-2 win for the LA Galaxy. Or, excuse me, for the San Jose Earthquakes. Over the nine games, Sophie, 2-5-2 two, and two at Stanford Stadium for the LA Galaxy. And they have uh, 15 goals for and 20 goals against. The games are usually close, usually, but the Galaxy usually end up losing them. All right? So, does that make you feel uh, any any better uh, about the LA Galaxy going to San Jose? should have started off with the bad news first and then ended <laughs> then, up with the good news. We were on kind of a roll. I think, you know, maybe some people in chat are buying into what we're selling. Maybe, I don't know. But I think maybe some fans are just at that point where they have no trust left. And okay. that is a tough spot to be in. And I think... Every fan that feels that way has a legitimate reason um, to not have that trust. Yeah. However, with that said, regarding the dating and the timing of this particular match, totally different, right? It is. This, a San Jose team that probably has is the weakest it's been in years, uh, right? Per, perhaps. It, I mean, again, they haven't been playing horrible at home. So I, I feel like if they're on the road, yes, they're absolutely the weakest team. And... They're the, uh, let's see, they're the 27th place team. Uh, they're just slightly above DC United in terms of the right, overall Right, but they're not points. pushing for playoffs. They're no, not they're in eliminated. that zone. They're, they're not, eliminated. You know, they're, they're not doing yeah. any of that type of stuff that, they, that we've been used to seeing this team do. Now, with that said, it doesn't matter those stats. I know they're important to look at. What matters is you've got to win this game. And it's hard to kind of get your head around doing that when the results and the stats tell you that the likelihood of that happening is unlikely. Mm -hmm. But like I said at the top of the show, this is where they have to turn the corner. They've got to throw all that out the window the same way they did with Colorado. They've got to win this game. There's just... Uh, I think if they don't win this game, um, you can really say bye to the playoffs. Because I just don't think... I The stadium is tough. It's like golf, right? Mm-hmm. People play Tiger Woods instead of the course. You can never play Tiger Woods. And golf's all about playing the course. You've got to beat the course. Right. And Tiger would pe beat people. It, and it's the same. Galaxy can't think about the stadium. They just can't. They've got to throw all that out the window. And there's a lot of players that maybe haven't played there yet that could change that. And I think Ricky's one that is a total different X Factor, Josh, yeah. that adds another dimension to it. Uh, I it don't was know. I, I, I get where you're going, by the way. $5 super chat from Paul. Paul says, do you feel Jovalich's uh, level of soccer and amount of goals dried up after Ricky and Brugman's arrival? And if you do, why is that? Um, do you feel like mm. uh, like Jovalich hasn't really been question. the same with Ricky and Brugman around? I have I have an answer. I'll let you go first, and then I'll I'll, I'll kick what well, I how think. How many chances has he been given? Not too many. Right. It seemed like after the, the – was it against Kansas, the 442 experiment? It felt like he was a bit punished. Was it against Kansas? It may have been. And and uh, and he kind of got punished, I think, for that performance a little bit. You know, this is where I think Greg has maybe benched players, not blaming them, but like you said with Costa, don't like what I see. You're going into the timeout corner for a few games, and I can't deal with you just yet. Yeah, I mean, I, and I I just don't think he's had the chances that maybe to shine and thrive. And he's definitely missed chances when he's come on as a sub. I lately. mean, that's so I think that what you're seeing from Jovalich has less to do with Ricky and Brugman and anything. I think it has to do with his regression towards his actual expected goals. He was way outperforming his expected goals, like way over the top. And you're so normally we would expect a regression back from that. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes this is the adjustment that comes in, right? It's like, this guy is that good. So the expected goals of where he's sort of scoring from and how this goes, you're like, he's just that good. And so he's going to continue to outperform it. I think that you've seen him get about the same number of minutes that he probably had at the beginning of the year, just because remember, so if he was coming on with like eight minutes to go and he would score a goal, and he was coming on with like this, and I still think he's getting that. He's just not getting the goal, and he had a chance against um, uh, against Colorado to come on and, and do that. He had an empty net. It was, I think it was tougher than, or it was an empty net, but he bought, he dribbled through three guys and yeah, yeah, had a yeah. good shot on that. Yeah. It was a tough goal to make, but you know he didn't. So I, to me, I think he's fine. I wouldn't worry about him. I think that he's going to be a very big 
important piece whenever it comes to if the Galaxy make the playoffs or if the Galaxy are down a goal and they sort of need to get that. In recent games, uh, they haven't really been in a position to benefit from his like late goals to either tie the game or win the game. And right. I think that he does better when there's more pressure on him to sort of do that. So He's a definitely a player that thrives on that. Also, real quick, I don't know if he's disgruntled just a little bit because he did say, I'm the future, right? And he loves that, right. being the main man. And maybe he thinks and deserves, and I think a lot of um, Galaxy fans feel like he deserved more starting chances than he got this season. So maybe he's a little disgruntled going through a bit of a dip because he was on fire for so long. Um, but the good news is you're getting goals from different positions so you don't have to rely on him to come on and be the super sub hero all the time at this point. I, I but think you're going to need him in the playoffs if you get there. I, I talked to Greg about him a while ago and just sort of like, do you worry that you have to get him more minutes and that type of thing? And he goes, you know, Dayon is extremely smart. He understands like the game and how it needs to be played in terms of he understands his role. I think Sasha Kleschen said something to that as well. You know, I, and Sasha was really working with Dayon and, and sort of being like, your role is to come on and score goals. It doesn't matter if you have one minute or seven minutes. And Dayon has told us the same thing. I don't care. I only want to come out and, mm -hmm. and score goals. It's funny because people will will say that Chicharito has like this big ego and that he's this guy who lets his ego take over for things. And maybe that's privately, maybe, maybe that's true. I don't see it. But I again, but the guy who has one of the biggest egos on the team is Dayon, and it serves him well. It's good that he has the ego. It is the me against the world, me with a chip on my shoulder, mm -hmm. one minute or 10 minutes or 50 minutes or 90 minutes. I'm going to score goals. I don't care. And if Greg. Uh, if Vanny is going to insult me by not playing, I'm going to show him and score more goals. You know, like it's that type of ego and chip and just the way he plays that serves him well. Um, and I think a lot of times, you know, who had a gigantic freaking ego? Well, two guys come off the top of my head immediately. Gigantic ego is Zlatan Ibrahimovic. That one's duh. But, oh, yeah, well. but Robbie Keane. Robbie Keane had a Keane. huge ego. Massive. Massive. You couldn't, yeah. you, we could hardly fit in the locker room with his head. Right? Oh yeah, great guy. Yeah. By the I mean, way. he snipped at me a couple times, Robbie yeah. Keane. Dare you ask about? How do you who, know? Who are, who are you, you to ask me to be questioning the king? Yeah. and it's like, yeah, you're right. Actually, uh, you, you're right. Yeah, and he's earned that, right? He and and that served him well. So, <laughs> those are the types of things that I'm like. Sometimes it is about to, um, it is about the ego. And I think that Jovlich has such a huge upside next season that the galaxy. Uh, may find him a partner and you know he may end up being a full-time starter next year so um. but he's he's gonna want to start yeah i don't care about the one minute two minutes he is going to want to play as much as he can That's and he should be given the opportunity I, I think he'll be given some opportunities i also think he's been given some of those opportunities and not necessarily always produced for greg whenever he has so you know uh greg very 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 easily came out and sort of said something that you know hey with jovalic and chicha up top i don't always get what i want out of those two guys and it's just mm -hmm. they're, they're too similar so depending on what type of forward they go to replace Chicharito assuming Chicharito's gone maybe there's a better fit for Jovalich to play in in you know with another forward in formations that gets him more minutes that does all those things so uh it's gonna be interesting to watch I think that'll be one of those interesting off-season things to sort of see how they build a team and yeah, whether or not they sure. build the team without thinking of Jovalich or whether they they think that perhaps, or whether they're building it with your bullish in mind, and I think that. I think he's a flow things. player. He needs to play week in, week out to hit that groove. I think he's the type of player that when he gets cold, so do the goals. It's hard for him. He's an yeah. impact player like that. He has to ride off the, the kind of the wave and stuff. So, and also Chicharito, I found him to be the least. What was the word you said that some people thought he was? Not arrogant, selfish, yeah, like e egotistical, or, or egotistical. Yeah. Yeah. I have seen the complete opposite covering him. I so see I don't I say that too. People don't believe he's me. He's a teddy bear with a shotgun. Well well the other problem that I get with him is like I'm kinda wish he was more about himself sometimes because I just want to find like sometimes I want to ask him a, a, a hey Chicha, how'd you score that goal? Like tell me about that goal. And he's like, you know, it doesn't matter how I scored the goal. My teammates got me the ball and I scored the goal. And it's like Dude, could you just could you just be selfish for a little bit? Are you frustrated you're not scoring goals? I don't care if I'm scoring goals or not scoring goals as long as the team is winning. And maybe that's a front and maybe that's a face. I tend to believe him whenever he says that. Being the captain and yeah. the leader. Yeah. And oh, that's what oh, he's selling you. Also, people say that Chicharito's not a good leader. I've heard that too. And I would disagree with that as well, seeing him in the positions that I have and talking to players and rooting guys on and doing all the stuff that he does. I disagree with that too. But 
again, maybe we're too close to it. Maybe it's easier to see that whenever you don't get to talk to him all the mm. time and you don't get to hear him all the time and you don't have to listen to everything he says and blah, 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 the whole deal. So uh, that can be the case, there although... I would believe the opposite is true, that we would get more sort of an understanding of him from being around him so much. Right. And most footballers have an ego. You have to have a certain arrogance to believe that you're the best to achieve those kinds of lofty goals in the game. As an athlete, you have to. And I think he's been humbled a little bit, you know. And when you get to the twilight of your career, you know it's not going to last as long. I think that you adapt and play the game in a different way. And I just don't think every leader has to be a yeller. Look at, you know, Sasha's a great leader. He does it in different ways, kind of professor-esque type yeah. of ways, teaching, I, but, master. But see, you and I would have that opinion, having talked to players and knowing sort of the interaction. Mm -hmm. But people who people say that Sasha's not a good leader or that Victor Vasquez isn't a good leader. And it's like, I just, I don't get where you see that. But maybe it's because we get to see these guys, you know, a little up closer. Because they're not winning. Yeah. It's all because of that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, it is. You're right. When, again, winning fixes everything, right? These everybody is good whenever whenever it's uh, it's winning, right? So, we'll I, see. I've never I've never been so impressed. Not never been, but I'm so impressed with Victor Vasquez. Every single time he comes out and talks to the media, the dude is a class act. Always. And you can tell that he influences the younger players. You can Always. tell those players have those leadership skills. They just do it very, very differently. And what's that worth to the team, right? Because there's always the, you know, how much should you pay for somebody who's who's worth more off the field than perhaps on the field? I think Sasha's fits into that. Sasha's making league minimum. I don't know if you, how, you, how you can complain about that. Um, you know, Victor Vasquez makes more money and he's lost a step this year. And that's mm -hmm. because he's older. I mean, it happens, yep. those types of things. Um, I think Sasha's the same. I think Sasha's lost another half step. And and that it, it, but how valuable is he? Like, would you bring him back next year? And people are like, no, I wouldn't. Bring. He's making league minimum. He's making eighty seven thousand dollars or something like that. Yes, it's a roster spot, but there's lots of other roster spots who will give you the same on the field and nothing mm -hmm. off the field. And also, so it's invaluable having him around the place because he wants to be a coach. He's doing his badges right. And what what you know, someone that maybe future in the near near future could end up becoming back in, you know, as a coach. Um, who Very wouldn't well. want him around? I, and he's 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 getting a lot out of LA Galaxy, as are they out of him, with some of these young players they have around. Well, I mean, and then the argument is, if, if there really is nothing that is sort of on the field, then make people coaches, right? Then then make them coaches off the yeah. field, because then you can get that same sort of thing. I get it. I understand all the arguments. Um, when we look at San Jose and wrapping up San Jose, I would like to point out this is one of my favorite ones. The Galaxy won their last away match against the San Jose Earthquakes, a 3-1 victory in June of 2021. LA hasn't won consecutive away MLS Cali Classicos since 1997 and 98, three straight, including the breakaway shootouts uh, going on. So um, that's a pretty one. I talked to you about the Earthquakes have lost only three home games. Uh, only mm -hmm. conference leaders Philadelphia and LAFC have fewer home losses than the Earthquakes since March 1st. Again, it's not at home, so I don't know if that really matters. It's their home game. It's at Stanford Stadium, but it's still not the home pitch at PayPal, the home pitch at Pay, 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 PayPal Park. Stupid names for stadiums. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of uh, what else I want to make sure everybody knows. Uh, Ricky Puj assisted on three gal three of the Galaxy's four goals, and the he's the first LA Galaxy player to do that since Landon Donovan in 2014. Um, all right. San I love Jose. how he bellows at people, yeah. Ricky. He, he get at that. He, and I like how he makes his hair taller, like you do, to make yourself look taller. Yeah, I know. I see, absolutely. I see you over there. You add, a, you add yeah. three or four inches just by making your hair a little bit taller. Yeah, Ricky uh, knows. Uh, I said it already. I'll say it again. San Jose has been eliminated from the postseason. Um, Victor Vasquez said something after maybe the Vancouver game or maybe it was the game before that. But um, he was talking. Maybe it was the SKC game. Um, and he was talking about it and he goes, you know, I talked to some of the SKC players, some of the Spanish SKC players. And I said, you know, well, what's the what's the deal? And he said, you know, we have nothing to lose. We're out there playing with nothing to lose. San Jose has absolutely nothing to lose. They would very much like direct the LA Galaxy's chances of getting into the playoffs and oh, they have a chance to do that. Yes. Right. Absolutely. One hundred percent. Beware. Fans and team want to spoil any potential playoff party. The LA Galaxy. This is the. The last game in hand, the LA Galaxy must take a stand. There is no way they can lose this game. Otherwise, 
it would be totally lame. I just uh, made that up, by the way, the, on the spot. I don't I, I know like where it. it came from. I like it. I yeah. like it. I think it works. Uh, if you look at San Jose's recent results, a 6 nothing loss to Cincinnati in Cincinnati, a 2-1 loss to Colorado in Colorado, 1-1 draw to a 10-man FC Dallas team. Uh, both of those teams scored in the first half relatively soon. San Jose scored their only goal on a penalty kick, and then were up a man, I think, for like the last 30 minutes or something like that, and apparently nothing happened. Like nothing because the highlights just like go from the red card to Areola basically to like five minutes left in the game. Um, so uh, a 1 1 draw there. Uh, Obobuse is a really good player. He can score lots of goals. He's mostly their, their guy in terms of the guy who's going to score goals. This is a team that is a counter attacking, fast paced team. Uh, look out for guys like uh, Caden Cowell, um, you know, Jackson Yule, some of the younger players that are out there. Uh, we talked a little bit, I think, about um, Espinosa, who has 13 assists as well. He's sort of the guy who is the dish, the guy who, who sends things out and is the, is the guy who's dishing out to other players. Um, so they will look to exploit the LA Galaxy's weakness if the Galaxy get caught out of position. San Jose does have the talent even though they're a last place team, does have the talent to punish people on the counterattack. So just keep that in mind as you sort of uh, watch this San Jose team. But their defense is is porous, Sophie. It, it absolutely yes. is ripe for the LA Galaxy to pick off and, and score some goals. And 538 actually has the LA Galaxy's offense ranked as the third best offense. And most of that is goes off of XG, expected goals. Most of the way that they rank it is off of the expected goals, but the LA Galaxy are have the third best offense in Major League Soccer at 1.6, their rankings, right? And so 1.8 is Philadelphia, 1.7 is LAFC, and then it's the LA Galaxy at 1.6. Um, wow, so that's, that's very interesting. It is Another very interesting. interesting stat, Josh. You've pulled it out the bag once again with Always. the stats and the colorful spreadsheets. Absolutely Spot on, as always. Uh, LA Galaxy also right now, according to 538, a 79% chance of making the playoffs. A They have them as a 1% chance of winning MLS Cup. I like that 1%, by the way. Uh, that's better than everybody who's less than 1% below them. So the LA Galaxy is still sort of sitting in that, that spot. And they expect the goal difference to finish around plus 5, and they expect the points to finish around 48. That's sort of, you know, Portland to finish at 48, the, you know, Minnesota to finish at 48. Remember how I said that there was possibility that you'd have everybody stacked up on top of each other? Well, the tiebreakers are coming and the LA Galaxy need to be in control of those tiebreakers. So win everything and, and hopefully they will uh, they will move forward. Let me get to, uh, to I'll, I'll give me one second because Herb gave us a $29 super chat. Uh, hey, Josh. Hey, Sophie. Late to the show. Hope you got a decent amount of super chats for your engineer slash conductor club. See, the guys are trying to help me run the train. I love I, it. I appreciate that. So, uh, yes, everybody's been most kind today, and we really appreciate it. So, Sophie, uh, final thoughts on San Jose and your prediction, please. Yes. Uh, Greg Vanny, how many years has he been LA Galaxy coach now, please? Right. This, will, this is Two the end years. of his second year. Yep. Okay. How many playoffs has he made so far? Zero. Right. Uh, how many years has it been since the LA Galaxy have made the playoffs? Uh, last in the playoffs in 2019, won one game, lost the second game. Correct. It is time. There are no excuses. This is a five-star team. This was the team that was the standard bearer for everything good that happened in Major League Soccer. It's time to shift gears and take a change. You know, um, no talking like front office and all that jazz. This is about picking a team that could go out on the pitch and win a game. Nothing more, nothing less. Three points. That's it. And then you tackle the next game as you go. As for fixing the club and all the rest of that stuff that will come in the offseason, what decisions are made. But for now, this club has got to get into the playoffs. That's it. Win. Yeah. Um, I No excuses, Josh. None. No, Zero. I, no, but there's a difference between predicting a result and understanding that there's no excuses when that result isn't met. 4-2. Right? Yeah, you think 4-2. Okay. Um, I think this is going to be a very difficult game for the Galaxy to win. Um, I, I just, I, I don't like the history behind it. And I know people can say you don't pay attention to that and you're right. You shouldn't, but there's a reason those things happen. There's reason that certain teams are sure. sort of the, sort of the boogeyman of, of certain teams. You know, my, my biggest example of that is that if you were a baseball fan, the Yankees have been a really good team over the years. And for whatever reason, a lot of times they come in to play the angels who have not been a good team and the angels beat them and the angels have beat them on a consistent basis year over year over year. And you sit there and say, that doesn't make any sense. It goes against what everything we look at for me though. Um, 
I am I'm more in your camp, Sophie, which is I feel like something like we learned something against Colorado, like the team learned something against Colorado, like something clicked in a way that it maybe should have clicked a lot sooner. But that was way different than a lot of the games I've seen the L.A. Galaxy win. Um, it was total yes, domination. Yeah, right. It was total domination. It was it was understanding the points of where to attack. I said it earlier in the show. It was understanding where everybody was without knowing where they were. Right. Like it was that you have to know in your head where this guy is going to make the run. You're going to have to know in your head that, you know, Costa is going to cut inside and, the, and that uh, Araujo is going to sort of run around the outside and that there's going to be a chance for Chicha that he should make the near, near post run, that he should hook it in there because Julian's going to find him there if he does. And so often we've seen that miss and we didn't see anything miss. There was not a misfire on that Saturday night, which means that there was an understanding of how to play. Now, maybe it was a momentary understanding. Um, but I tend to believe in this team that I tend to believe this team has drastically underperformed for most of the season. I said that they should have been a top three team in the Western Conference. I still believe that in a lot of ways they mm -hmm. should be a, th a, a three a, a top three team because I don't know that they are not better than Nashville whenever they play Nashville. I don't know that they're not better than Dallas. Like they should be better than Dallas. I've seen Dallas play. The Galaxy can play better than Dallas. Um, I've seen this Galaxy team play the absolute best teams in Major League Soccer and make them look stupid and silly. Uh, so, again, this team has been underperforming. So is this the game that they learn to bury a 27th place opponent, regardless of where they play, regardless of who the opponent is, and regardless of the fact that it is on the road? If all those things match up the way, and I felt really positive ahead of the Vancouver game. Right, just to let you know sort of where I sat. And I said, I felt like maybe I got at the game too soon to be really positive about it because I was like, something is happening. I could see it building. Something is coming. And then they lose 3 nothing to Vancouver. It's like, that's not, that wasn't it. <laughs> I don't know whatever right. that was. That wasn't it. But now seeing against Colorado, it's like, that's what it was. That's what I was expecting, that next step. And for the first time under Greg Vanny, the LA Galaxy won a game. They were expected to win in a position to take advantage of results around the league and move themselves up the, up the, the table. And that, to me, was a step forward, too. So, having said all that, I think the LA Galaxy can win this game. I think it's a 3-2 win. I don't think it's pretty. I think it's ugly. Um, but if the Galaxy score first, they win the game. It's that simple. And, and San Jose doesn't get a chance to score a 94th or 95th minute winner like they've done a couple times to the other guys. It doesn't happen this time. Um, so we'll see sort of how that is all all in there. It's, it's I, I don't expect, and, and I think Patrick says, uh, uh, Patrick said, I want Bondi to have a boring game, right? Like it's, it's that dominant by possession by the LA Galaxy and all those things. Um, I expect that this won't be a pretty game. This is going to be a gross game. Um, it will not be. You as know pretty. what? Sometimes winning ugly is beautiful, and it yeah. doesn't matter how they win this game. Just win the game. Yeah. I I actually believe if you're a sensible LA Galaxy fan, sexy performance goes out the window. Just win the game. Just it doesn't matter. I don't care how doesn't you win. It. I don't care yeah. if the ball ricochets off of Chicha's butt and goes in the goal. I do not care. Um, or as we say in the train community, off his caboose. Um, yes. into, into the back of the goal. Well so, done. Thank well you. Done. Thank you. I really, well I fit that one in there, there at you the did. end. You did. Very good. Um, all right. So if that's it, I mean, I, I'm, I'm expecting quite honestly, I expect the galaxy to win out these next games. And I don't know that I felt that way before. And maybe that's being grossly optimistic for no reason. But again, I will go, I will stick by what I saw against Colorado. Something clicked. And if that yeah. clicked, then the galaxy can go on a run and just let them go on a run. Go for it. Some feng shui stuff going on in the background. I feel it. There's some mysticism, magicalism. It's that humidity. whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it's that humidity, right? It's that. It's, that, it's sort of. It's hugging you like a blanket. So it is. Um, anyway, it's that humidity. <laughs> That's right. I should be able to cover the game. I'm going to be in Colorado visiting my oldest. Um, but I don't think there's any reason why I shouldn't be able to cover the game or watch the game or do any of that fun stuff. So expect that that will happen. And if some reason it can't, I'll let you know. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Uh, anything else? Though? Brilliant. You good? No, I was just going to talk in my proper accent right now. Just, just uh, wanted to let you know that I expect LA Galaxy to win the game and win out and make it to the playoffs and go ahead and uh, maybe win the whole darn thing in the end. Who knows? Yeah, I, I was going to say Aaron's head is just exploded. He's like, <laughs> that was the real Sophie's accent. He was he was there. So I was I was I was daring Sophie to t do the entire podcast in her American accent. Uh, now bring or, me a whiskey. <laughs> 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 I guess whenever, anytime we ever do like a, 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 a mock accent, we really do 
sort of trade on like the biggest stereotypes of those particular accents, right? Like totally, if you, dude. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Hella fine, man. Hella fine. Yeah, I, yeah. I've gone from thinking of Jonathan Bod being Bond being bored in goal making teen scones <laughs> and over the weekend to come on, dude, let's go, let's win this goddamn oh, thing. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. All right. Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell people where they can find you, and we'll get on out of here. At Highbury Squad, uh, across all social platforms, and at Soccer Diva. Come give us a visit if you love talking world football, especially the Premier League. Josh, thanks for having me. You look fabulous. You're always awesome. And the spreadsheets today. I peaked. I peaked with the spreadsheets, I think. Big uh, time. If you're looking for me on Twitter, it's at Jay Gessman, J-G-U-E-S. M-A-N, and of course, at Galaxy Podcast. Head on over to cornerofthegalaxy.com where you can find our podcasts, where you can find all of our wonderful writings, anything we put up there, media, calls, all sorts of fun stuff is right there. All right, I guess uh, that's it. Everybody enjoy the game this weekend. Saturday coming up at 7 p.m., lagalaxy.com, Spectrum Sports Set, Joe, Kobe, and Nikki on the call. For Miss Sophie, the Canon Nicolau, I'm Josh, Pato Gessman. You've been listening. You've been watching to Corner of the Galaxy on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Have a great one, everybody. You've been listening to the Corner of the Galaxy podcast on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. Fans, we thank you for listening, and we ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo, and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everybody.